Welcome, everyone. Welcome to ICAD. Um, my name is Christophe Sarvan. I'm one of the director and founder of ICAD, and it's a pleasure to be with you today um, to introduce our, our speakers. Um, yeah, a very, very warm welcome um, opening this amazing three-day cycle of conference, and um, I think the themes are of the greatest um, importance and interest, and uh, we're going to start now. And we start with um, addiction in the workplace out of the shadows. Uh, I always believe that large elephant can cast very long shadows. <coughs> um, that's a big elephant. And I'm thrilled today that we, we, I think it's the first time at ICAD that we really address that directly and thoroughly. So I'm really, really, really thrilled um, that we, we're trying to name it, to shape it, to conceptualize it with you today. Um, maybe also from my previous life experience, uh, I know a bit about all those shadows. Um, so. The city of London, a world apart, um, rules, system, rituals, a lot, a lot that are specific, but also archetypal, I believe. And that can be derived, what we know from the workplace in the city, can be derived into many places, many countries, um, many other human beings, organizations, and systems. Uh, so this is what we, we're trying to address today. Um, three major, major significant a uh, player in trying to better people in the city today. Um, more than 20 years in the battlefield, in the trenches, in the ground. Uh, I'm a bit, being a bit military here, but I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's a good way to address it, probably. Um, so again, my stuff, probably. Um, I'm starting with, uh, with the middle with you, Neil, Dr. Neil Brenner, um, psychiatric consultant, um, specialized in addiction and co-disorders for many, many years. Um, around the last 25 years, really instrumental in the development of addiction treatment program in treatment centers, at the Priory Hospital and other places. Uh, but you're also at the heart of the battlefield, carrying on with my military analogy, um, having your private practice also in the city in Canary Wharf. Next on the right, Dr. Jill MacLeod. Um, again, 25 years of experience of what's happening, what's going on in terms of health in the city. Um, occupational health physician, um, I think you held senior position in the Royal College of Physicians in your past, um, and now you're the CEO of Woodland, um, uh, Wood Lane Medical Clinic. Um, to give you an idea, 120,000 GP consultations a year, 35,000 physiotherapy uh, sessions a year, the back and the brain goes together sometimes, um, and about 20,000 consultation in occupational health. That's the size of the experience and the size of the impact. So we're speaking big specialists here. Um, and last, um, from the therapist perspective, um, David Smallwood. David is a seasoned, seasoned, and again seasoned therapist came across you so many times, um, and with experience in, in managing and designing treatment programs uh, in major treatment centers, Kushnacht, Priory Hospital, um, integrating trauma reduction program into addiction treatment, um, and also having been involved massively into helping senior officers, less senior officers, working in the city. So again, a direct grip on what we're trying to address today. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm so happy you're there. Thank you so much for being with us today, the three of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know I was so important. I feel really good about myself now. Um, we thought we would uh, do this more or less without slides. I think David's done some slides for you. And very much ask you to make it a discussion, because I think that's where we're going to get the most out of it. Certainly, I'm going to get the most out of it. I'll put my hand up and say I'm not an addictions specialist. Right? I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. You're raising your eyebrows, David, because <laughs> I see so much addiction in my working life. So I've probably become a, a specialist without wanting to, without seeking that. I'll actually admit to um, 27 years in the city, actually, and very, very close working with David and with Neil, both of whom have been amazing colleagues professionally. And I will own a personal interest in this. They have both treated my daughter. So I have both a professional interest in addiction as an issue and a personal awareness of it and how it's impacted my life and my life experience. Um, the organization I work for is actually um, HCA International, 
which is part of the Hospital Corporation of America, which is probably the biggest private healthcare organization in the whole world. Um, I, I built my business, which was Rood Lane Medical, and it became part of HCA. And we now actually um, have the primary care arm of HCA, and that's what I run. So what's that got to do with addictions? Well, have any of you worked in the city? Oh, it's, it's a natural magnet for addicts. Um, it's where they all go to play if they can work at a very functional level, I think. And uh, it forms an enormous part of my working life. So my role in this business is that I am the executive director for primary care for HCA in the UK. So that's quite a big um, estate. And actually, the 120 is the Rood Lane bit of it. But we probably see something like 200,000 GP consultations, about 30 to 40,000 OH consultations. And how much of that is about addiction might be the bit that interests you. The answer is that in occupational health, an enormous amount of it is about addiction. And that is why when I was looking for which psychiatrists and therapists I would work with in this environment, I ended up um, meeting Dr. Brenner and, and forming a very successful working relationship with him and with David, treating the sorts of people that we see all of the time. So that's kind of who I am and where I come from, what I do. Um, and, uh, you know, why the city? What's the relevance of the city to this? Well, the city is somewhere where addiction hides in plain sight. Um, the city loves addiction. Somebody said he worked in the city. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. The city loves addiction. It loves people who want to stay up all night. It loves people who want to run around the world traveling. It loves power and money and gambling and all of those things that they're all about addiction. And some people can cope with that, and some people can't. But it is where addiction hides, not only in plain sight, but is almost wanted, sought, desired. That, those kind of behaviors are encouraged by the city. And whilst the city has been very good in recent years at embracing the whole issue of mental health, and I train the mental health par par partners for, for the big four in the city, amongst others, and I do a lot of work around mental health in the city, it shies away from addiction. You'd be surprised how little addiction is ever discussed in those mental health sessions in the city. You can talk about mental health till you're blue in the face in the city. You can have meetings about that once a week in all of the big companies, but not about addiction because that doesn't feel very comfortable. And I won't say which of the big four, but when I suggested they might have alcohol-free partners meetings, he fell about laughing and said, well, nobody would turn up. Why would we do that? I would, there would be a revolution if I did that. So um, I, th I thought it was important to say the city really is absolutely, and by city, please um, understand that I don't mean the physical city of London. That's where most of these companies began or are based, but actually they're right across the UK now and they're multi-sited and, and more, more devolved than they originally were. So it's an environment which encourages addictions where addicts can hide in plain sight. It rewards addictive behaviors. It likes all of the extremes. It loves people who want to be up all night, want to be running around the world, want power, want money, want control, want authority, want to be narcissistic, all of those things. And what kinds of addictions do we see? I made a list. It's not exhaustive. Huh. Is that me? No, okay. I made a list, it's not exhausted. So well, if you like work and long hours, the city is going to like you. It's unusual for people to work less than a 12 hour day, to not work in the evenings, to not work on the train or, or during the weekends. And of course, that gives them an excuse to disengage from their families and their social lives and their personal lives and their own feelings because there's always work to be done and that is always more important because that's what I am and that makes me really important in my world. Travel, uh, the city, it's easy to hide. If you've got a problem, emotional problems, addiction problems, you can spend a lot of time on aeroplanes if you're in the city, or as an absolute minimum on trains. So you can be all over the place and everywhere and nowhere, um, whenever you want to be. It encourages power and it's built on money. So it's all about having, wanting, getting more competitiveness. There's a gym in most of the big organizations, so you can exercise to your heart's content. If that's one of your addictions, it will encourage you to do that. 
Alcohol is present all the time in all of the environments. One of the struggles I actually face working as a doctor in the city, because I have a very major commercial role within the business as well as practicing medicine, is it's really difficult to get through a week without having a drink. If you decide, I mean, I don't, I'm not abstinent myself, but if, you, if you're going to meetings, taking people out and doing all these other things, alcohol is absolutely rife in that setting, as indeed are drugs, in all fairness. In terms of drugs in the city, we see a lot of cocaine use, a modest amount of cannabis use, not a lot of heroin, probably is some. Um, people tend to be high functioning, so they will use the drugs that allow them to stay awake, to function at speed and all the rest of it. They'll switch themselves on and off. They'll use a lot of alcohol because it's socially acceptable. They will tend not to use drugs that are gonna make it more difficult for them to function. So generally speaking, reasonably high functioning. And of course, there's gambling. It's almost the definition of the trading floor is an, a gambler's den, um, and you are rewarded for doing it. You're rewarded for being bold with that, and you're rewarded for creating the structures that encourage it in others. Risk-taking, it's all very adrenaline-fueled and very exciting, and it is what you're paid to do, to be a gambler. Do we see food addiction? Um, truthfully, not much, because the, the city's very body-conscious. So it's okay to be very ripped and, and in the gym all the time. It's okay to be too thin. To overeat is actually something that doesn't sit very well in the city. So I don't see a great deal of food addiction in that setting. But I think you'd agree with me, Neil, we see any amount of cross addiction oh, yeah. and people flipping between one addiction and the next over and over again. So I was trying to think what else might you find interesting about my experience. Well, my clinical practice is occupational medicine, so I don't do the GP work. I would say that of people who are off work for more than six months and go on to income protection, which is long-term disability insurance, which is normal throughout these businesses, I would say 70 to 80% of mental health. A little bit of cancer, some chronic degenerative diseases, but the vast majority is mental health. My experience is that in those mental health cases, addiction is very, very common indeed. And it's quite quite confusing actually in terms of addiction treatment because um, some of the insurance policies won't pay for it, um, which is an absurdity when you think about it in terms of the fact that it is such a common problem. So we just call it depression and anxiety and smile nicely and sign the paperwork and, and off you go. So the data won't necessarily reveal the extent to which the, the problem is addiction. So how much do I personally see? Oh, a huge amount. I mean, my personal role in the city because of the evolution of my career and my own sort of uh, business profile is that I tend to see the people at the top end of the businesses and the people with the most complex mental health or employee relations type issues. And I see just masses. I thought, could I give you any anecdotal stories? Well, I don't think I want to in case they're identifiable. But I can say that I probably see half a dozen to a dozen addicts a week um, in my practice, and I only do two to three days of clinical medicine, and all of my appointments are a minimum of an hour. So that gives you an idea of the proportionality of the pathology that I would be seeing. And uh, <clears throat> of course, there are loads of meetings in the city. I'm sure you all know, you all know that, but that's actually, there's a lot of support there as well. So there is that acknowledgement of the need for it. And I wanted, so I had some questions that I thought might be helpful to pose today because I do want this to be mainly a discussion. How well do the addicts do in the city if we treat them was one of the questions that was in my mind. Do they have to leave if they're going to survive? Some of them do. Do they stay and become evangelical? Do they stay and do well? I think on balance, but it's an open question and I want you to tell me what you think from your experience because that will also help me to learn. But I think... I think a lot of them have to leave in the end because actually it is such an absolute magnet for addiction and so riven with addictions that it's quite difficult to survive there um, as an addict and be well. So I think a lot of them do leave. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, because this is the world I know, so this is the world I've worked in for 27 years, so I'm used to dealing with these addicts. What makes them different? Um, they're highly successful in terms of the way that people are perceived in our cultures. So we admire them. We almost reward, as a culture, we reward the addictive behaviors. That's one of my thoughts about what makes them different. 
we don't see them as the down and outs or the people really struggling or his lives are falling apart. Often they are. I mean, <laughs> serial marriage is one of the other addictions that the city has. So you have a lot of people who are on their third or fourth wives and young children towards the end of their careers. But what makes them different? And what specific help does this group of people need this group of people who is very good at hiding in plain sight, very good at appearing to cope and be okay, what, what help do they need? Because actually they don't show their needs quite as well as some other people do. They are, they are so well concealed, so well buried, so many layers over the top that they're quite difficult to help or even get close to. I mean, I've, I've worked with people for a year who've got all sorts of problems in the city before they've actually owned up to the fact that one of the underpinning problems is addiction. And actually, once you start to get to that level, and they're, they're that good, because I'm pretty good at spotting it. So that's me and what I have to offer today, which I hope will be helpful. And the idea is that we'll turn this into discussion. So I'm not going to spend hours standing talking at you. And the reason we've chosen to speak in this order is that I would be typically first point of presentation. So I would see somebody, and then I would phone my PA and say, can you get this one in with Neil Brenner, please? As quickly as possible, like maybe tomorrow would be good. So um, that's over to Neil as number two on the podium to say what he does when I get them to him. Good morning. Um, if any of you know me, I don't use the podium. I wonder. I'm sorry. It's just my ADHD gone wild. Um, I've not prepared anything because I really do want this to be a, a discussion, but I do want to just tell you what I do and why I think it might be useful. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I'm a doctor like any other doctor who's trained in the psychological aspects of medicine. And I have been working in the city uh, with Jill McLeod for possibly more years than I'm prepared to totally admit to. Um, and uh, in that point, when Rude Lane started, there were, what, three or four doctors, and now it is an extraordinary organization. And what I see is a pyramid. And maybe that's the way to think about it. The people at the top of the pyramid are the people that present and we see. But addiction in the workplace is much bigger than just the ones that present to see doctors and psychiatrists. There is a large body of people at the bottom of the pyramid who are working, not just the city, but any organization, who have major mental health problems and don't get to get any help or treatment. And one of the reasons is they don't actually recognize they have a problem. Now, in the city, that is amplified by the fact that the city, to me, is a giant magnet. It's this large magnet that pulls in addiction at great numbers, because if you're an addict, it is a great place to work. There are gyms, there's bars, there's drugs, there is workalism off the scale. Things I didn't know about like people sleeping under their desks in the office so they don't miss anything. Marriages, social interactions go right out the window and they lose the perspective. They understand they're very high functioning and that goes all the way down the city. It doesn't just necessarily mean the chief executives at the top. We're talking about people in the post room are high-functioning, hard-working, and I, I always say that quite often I don't see the chief executive, I see the chief executive secretary, who has been often bullied, abused, traumatized, depressed by what's going on in the workplace. So, why do we not in this giant pyramid see more people at the lower end? Well, it is structured. The city is a very rigid place of structure. The people at the top and going all the way down through to the post room and you all know your place and it's all kept within that and they look after you. They look after you very well. There's plenty of food, there's plenty of gym and all sorts of interesting things. But they, because what is the purpose of you being there? The purpose of you being in the city is to work. 
and make the organization money, wherever you are in the hierarchy. And that rigidity makes it really very difficult for people sometimes to put their hands up in all aspects of mental health, to say, I'm not well, I can't cope, I can't do it, because there's a door. And the, whether the door's there, it is perceived to be there. That you're always fighting to be, not be made redundant or thrown out. That's how they keep you there. All the fancy other bits, money and such, like come with it. So when people come to see me, uh, often via Dr. McLeod or someone like that, they often will not, and what Dr. McLeod said a minute ago is so true, it might be the third or fourth appointment before they're going to turn around to me and say, I've got an addiction problem of some nature. Or you, at the end of the first point, you point out that maybe them going to the gym six times a week for two or three hours is a problem. They're looking, but why? Why? Then you get the other point, and this is such a common statement. When you point out that they're drinking possibly half a bottle of whiskey a day, and they turn around to you and say, but that's the same as all my colleagues. Yeah? And so you have... The city is based and survives on denial. Because if you don't have it, you're on your way out. So one of the problems we have to do, and I know it's so easy for an audience like you to say, to, 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 to understand this, is that the first thing you have to do in the city is crack the denial. Now, I, Dr. McLeod invited me some years ago to talk to uh, a, a group of city... Um, HR, human resource people. And um, one of the, after the, we're having a very interesting chat and such, like, it's all very lovely, um, I come to them and say to the, 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 the audience, um, so can you just tell me what your drug policy is? Silence. Not a movement. Now, come on, come on, just tell me what your drug policy is. And one very, very sweet lady halfway back in the audience puts her hand up. And as I said to her, she told me which organization she came from. And she said, um, um, our drug policy is very clear. I said, oh, fantastic. Can you just explain that? Don't. <laughs> that was the entire drug policy. And, and in all fairness, they had one. A lot of the other organizations didn't have anything. Because two have a drug policy is to admit you might have a problem. And to have that is, 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 is we all know the statistics about mental health and, and we all know the statistics about drug use in the city and all of that stuff. That's all easy. But the real problem that I see in the city is getting the individuals to accept that they have a problem, but also, and here's the hard part, get the corporates to accept there might be problems. Now, there are plenty of studies, not actually very many in this country, but in the states that look at the incidence of uh, drug abuse. And it is almost only drug and alcohol abuse. There's nothing but um, behavioral addictions uh, in the workplace. In financial organizations, it runs, and these are not people that have been referred, in the lower ends of the pyramid, at about 8 to 9 percent. Now, if you go to other organizations and other different bodies, different employers, that goes up much higher. The entertainment industry, it's nearly 15%. So these are vast numbers of people who have not been recognized and not treated. Dr. McLeod's comment earlier is one that, oh boy, I can sympathize with. Insurance companies. Um, most, a lot of the city insurance policies will not cover much in the way of addiction. And often, the way we have to take people is out of their environment to <coughs> detoxify them, not just from the drugs and alcohol, but all the other addictions, the exercise, the work, relationship stuff, to try and get them to break that denial. And it's really difficult because they don't, are not covered by uh, insurance. Uh, <laughs> some people will pay for itself, or we have to recommend other things. So this can be a real issue for the companies, and I think some companies don't even know they're not covered for addiction properly. So that can be a major problem into, into organizing recovery for uh, people. Can it work? Oh, yes, it can. 
I have a num many patients who have done amazingly well. Uh, some of them might be here these next three days. Uh, some of them have gone on to all sorts of wonderful careers elsewhere. Some of them back in the city. And we have a few, uh, shall we say, evangelical. And it's brilliant. It's wonderful. Uh, back in the city working well. And the way I get around it, because if you're going to talk to corporates about treatment, it's no good telling them about the recovery and how well patients are going to be and happy and so on. They don't understand that. What they understand is the subject, the subject about money. So what I say to them, do you know what? I'm going to save you money. Not only am I going to treat this person, make them better and well and do da 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 da, but they're going to come back and they're going to work better. They're going to be more efficient. Not working the 12, 14 hours a day, but working eight hours and doing it properly. Because one of my greatest interventions in the city is switching the lights off, telling people to go home. Um, so the really important thing is to be able to speak the language that people in the city and big corporates understand and say to them, because if you get rid of this person, you're going to have to then recruit to that post, and that's very expensive, and da 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 and there's gaps in your services, etc., etc. So I can help you save money. And once you put them in those terms, you can see the light bulb start to go on, and you can start to help uh, uh, people get into treatment. <coughs> Dr. McLeod has spent her lifetime working with big corporates to understand these problems. I treat individuals not corporates. And my job, I hope, I hope, is to help people get well. And not only get well, but stay well. And therefore, taking them out of the city, or a corporate, which has helped them be ill, and then you have to reintroduce them back. You've got to be very careful that we aren't just sending person back into the pub. Or the using facility. So it's about having to work very carefully. And that's why a lot of people then, you can see the light bulbs come on in their brains and they see in recovery that actually the city might not be the place for them. And they go off and have all sorts of interesting other careers. So there are lots of questions to talk about. I'm going to be, I'll happily be controversial. You know me, some of you. I'll happily say things that people might not like to hear. And I've got a number of questions that we could suppose to an audience like, why does the country spend so much money on type 2 diabetes but wouldn't spend anywhere like that on the treatment of addiction? Why is it a person is perceived to have a self-inflicted illness called addiction where people who are, are grossly overweight don't do an exercise and a heart attack? They would never be perceived as having had any responsibility for their illness. There we are. I thought I'd throw that one at you. <laughs> and uh, so we can discuss some of these areas. I'm going to hand over to David, who's the person who gets them better. <laughs> OK. Um, where to start? Um, when I first started as a, um, a trainee therapist uh, some years ago, um, I was talking to a, a guy I was working for called Robin, and Robin told me this story about working in the city and uh, he was asked to go into the bubble one day, talk to his boss and the boss said, it's come to my attention that you're snorting cocaine off your desk. And um, he said, you've just got to stop. Uh, what you need to do is be clean during the week and then really go for it at the weekend. <laughs> um, and that's uh, quite often, uh, you know, uh, a, a place where um, that, that mentality still exists. Um, I'm very fortunate in as much that, you know, I was thinking when, when Jill was, was, was talking and, and, and Neil, that um, we have um, a, a connection. Uh, I, I'm really privileged to work with people who are so astute. Um, Jill, she says she's not, she's not in the addiction field, but actually I know no one who's better at spotting an addict than she is. And I've met quite a few. Um, she's amazing. Neil is a very caring, loving guy. He's not a medication person, uh, but he has great empathy with uh, this illness. And you know, to be working with these people is, is for me, is, is, a, is a real privilege because I, I feel somehow um, 
uh, not a fraud, but you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't feel quite on the same level sometimes. I, I, my, my job's therapy. It's not the, the really important stuff, you know. Um, but uh, let's press on. So the first thing I want to uh, just show you are just a couple of, of, um, of facts. Um, this is from Quest Diagnostics off their website. Um, so just to show you that this is not getting any better anytime soon. So methamphetamine, 64% up. That's a lot. All right, methamphetamine's not a huge problem yet, but it's going to be. 4.2% um, um, 4, 4 of all urine tests positive. And interesting here that the, the, uh, the positivity rate for cocaine in post-accident, so when someone's had an accident and they test them, uh, is twice as bad as if they were having a job because you know, any addict worth his salt knows that you stay off cocaine for a couple of days, it's not in your system and then you can get the job. Uh, but when something happens, then maybe uh, um, uh, it's gonna be a much higher rate. Um, I've, these have already been talked about, but I'll just go through them again. The city is a very high pressure place to work. It does require, I think as Neil said, very, very long hours. You know, if you walk out of a, a, an office in the city at six o'clock in the evening, you'll be frowned on. Everybody in the office will turn around and watch you because that's not the way it works. You know, you need to be at your desk at eight o'clock in the morning and won't be tired you if you leave before eight or nine o'clock at night. Why are people in the city? Well, you know, um, the city pays well. In real terms, you know, the average uh, employee earns quite a bit more than the average guy in the street. And um, that equates to security. However, what it doesn't equate to is the right place to be. So if you're chasing a job uh, that gives you high financial gain and hence security, but you're not right for it, it's going to cause you problems. And then, of course, within, as has already been said, uh, peer pressure means that, you know, you always go for a beer with the, the guys after work or at the weekend. Uh, and, you know, I see a, a sort of cluster in the city of alcohol, cocaine and sex. You know, people go for a couple of beers, then it's, shall we have a line? And then everybody gets horny and, and off we go. And, and it's a, it's a merry-go-round. And I've met people with horrendous stories. People going into hotel rooms with two prostitutes, several bottles of spirits, and you know, five or six grams of, of, of cocaine for the weekend. You know, that's their weekend recreation. But one of the ones that I see a great deal of, um, and it's very, very noticeable, is when someone um, in the city you could argue that everybody's using all the time. In other words, you start off and you have a career. And if that career is going in that direction, it, you feed off it. It's, it's great because you're going forward and forward and better and better and you get more money and more, more prestige, all the rest of it. But then somebody says, well, actually, you're not going to make managing director. You're only going to make executive director. And their career plateaus. That's when they fall apart because they have no no impetus anymore there's no 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 point in being there and that's when i see lots of people start to use it, it doesn't happen instantly but it, it it tends to go downhill so this is the bit where i indulge myself for a minute because i'm passionate about um working with people with addiction i want to tell you um about why it is i'm passionate and what it is i believe the core problem is so anybody's hear me, heard me before, I'm going to say the same thing again, but hopefully in a slightly different way. Um, if you look at the history of mankind, we have been in our pleasant, present state of understanding for less than 70,000 years. However, humans have been around for a lot longer. Oldest humanoid ever discovered was a, um, a skeleton of a, a little girl called Lucy in Odovai Gorge. Uh, she was 4.3 million years old. But we know there's a skeleton of an upright humanoid called Homo erectus that was 1.1 million years ago. At that point in time, the only reason, the only way that we survived was by using not our cognitive ability, but by using our limbic system, our fight, flight or freeze uh, 
parts of our brain. That's worked for a million years before we ever started using our cognitive ability. And you know, at that point in time, we had to be connected. If we're not connected, if in other words, if we're not part of a tribe, then we are disconnected and there's a risk of death. So, you know, if you're living on the savannah in Africa, which is where we all ended up, um, and you uh, are not part of a tribe, then you're on your own and there's wild animals, you're not gonna last very long at all. So it's in our DNA, it's in our very intrinsic nature to be connected. To be disconnected is a very difficult place to be. As we, walk, when we walked off the savannah 70,000 years ago and populated the world, we started to lose that connectedness. And we, we've tried to regain it. We got marriage together and we do all sorts of wonderful things in groups. But if you are disconnected, and moreover, the bit that, that makes the difference to me is the sensitivity that someone's born with. If you, if you, for me, if you want to look at what an addict's about and why it is that we do what we do, it's because we feel things more uh, uh, intensely than other people. So we tend to look for things to fix that, that distress that we get. Um, so if you're in the city and you're part of a tribe, okay. But when you get that very intense environment, people start to become unraveled. They feel, they're stressed, they're disconnected, they're not connected to something that feels whole. The whole city uh, echelon is based on stuff going down and normally in a very, very uh, uh, sort of pointed way. You're not doing this, this needs to happen, this needs to happen, this needs to happen. Uh, and people become disconnected from their, 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 their group uh, and consequently then look for things to try and fix that. If you have sensitivity um, as, a, as, a, as a, ch a child when you're born, and you know, I, if, I, if I went around a straw poll, how many people in this, this room would count themselves as sensitive? Put your hands up. <laughs> Yeah, you see, um, it, it, it's, it's always the case. Whenever I sit with a, a bunch of people doing this, doing what we do, it, 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 we, we are very, very, very sensitive people. And because we're very sensitive, what happens to you as a child can cause you, uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know some of this stuff because anybody who's uh, um, studied uh, codependence or peer melody will, will know this, but we pick up things that cause us problems in our development and we feel disconnected. We then look for something to reconnect us and a job uh, in, in, a, in the city is a really good place to be because it enables you to have what you think is the connectivity. You're working in a team, you've got lots of money, you can get married, you can have children, you can have a nice environment. But the cost is extraordinary. So my view on this is Yes, we need to see these people, we need to get them. We need, first of all, obviously, to stop the using. It is, w without it, nothing's going to happen. So that sometimes is a rehab, sometimes that's an uh, AA or NA. Sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes they just need to be able to talk through their issues with a therapist. But... Um, you know, there's a great, has been, in, in my experience, a great uh, sort of uh, emphasis on let's deal with what's, what's here. Well, that's okay, but I don't think it fixes the problem. If you don't take, uh, you, this gentleman over here said to me when I first met him, the most important thing is take a history. And it was one of the most important lessons I've ever heard. So I, when, I, when I get a, when a patient, a new patient, I look whence they came. I look at their childhood. Looking at what happened three weeks ago or six months ago or 12 months ago is important, it's, but it's not as important as finding out what it is that's wrong with this person intrinsically. Where are they coming from? You can identify developmental milestones. You can hopefully... Um, deal with that 
there are a number of trauma uh, 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 programs, so you can do ex uh, somatic experiencing, EMDR, trauma workshops. And re obviously continued recovery. The, the, the bit that I'm really sort of passionate about here is, uh, at the bottom there, talking about trauma does not reduce trauma. It makes it worse. Just identifying it does not, is not trauma work. That's my humble opinion. Um, I think that if you start talking about somebody's childhood but don't do anything about it, you don't put them through the right process. And my, my job, I'm also a bit of a, a sort of a hub because I get someone from Jill to Neil to me and sometimes then I have to send them to a trauma program to do their, their stuff. Regard, you know, depending on what that, that, that happens to be. Sometimes I have to do an intervention and get them into a rehab. Um, sometimes I can just do it by talking to them one-to-one. -one. Um, but it is vital that the people th that I see from the city deal with their childhood stuff as much as any part of their actual presenting addiction. Because to not do so is not giving them what they really need. Um, I think that's about me. Um, and... Um, Let's see what, uh, what comes up on the questions. I think we need, um, if you do want to ask a question, could I ask you to raise your hand and then we can get a microphone to you because people won't hear. Do we have someone who's doing microphones? Anyone got any questions? Don't all rush, it's a very old building. <laughs> It's a, comment, it's a comment and a question. Um, hello, my name's Rochelle. Um, I work for a uh, free addiction service in Hertfordshire, so I see uh, the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. but I still see the same problems of them um, being in a, uh, I know, the builder's world, and they all go out for drinks afterwards, so <clears throat> eventually they tend to have to leave their jobs. Um, so it's just the same story, the other end of the spectrum. I just wanted to pick up on the food addiction thing because I work a lot with disordered eating and um, dysfunctional behaviours. I'm, I'm just wondering how, much, how many eating disorders are hidden in the city, a bulimia. And you said not so much food addiction, but people can hide behind a normal way, a normal look, be highly functioning, especially anorexia. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how much of that is going on because you've sort of focused on the cocaine and the etc. I'd say, I mean, that's a really valid point, and there's no doubt that we see a lot of anorexia and bulimia in the city. What we don't see is food addiction and obesity because of the social stigma around obesity and the judgments of the city and the aesthetic judgments that the city makes, the desire that the city has for everyone to look exactly like everyone else, which is very powerful. Um, so, yes, we see a lot of um, anorexia and bulimia, and uh, I just anecdotally, to comment on, one of my colleagues saw a young man for a pre-employment pre medical, we now call them pre-placement because employment law has changed, but this young man, he said it was like watching an onion unpeel itself because he looked perfectly okay, and then he started taking his clothes off, and as the layers came off, the guy got smaller and smaller and smaller. And we actually went through a process of assessing him more formally for his fitness for the role that he was going into, and the bottom line is, that um, anorexics do very well in the city until they get too ill to cope with life. And um, sadly, the city welcomes it. They're very controlling. They tend to be perfectionist. They do really, really, really well. You see a lot of it in the law firms. So you're, you're, you're spot on right. As a behavioral addiction, absolutely it's there. The piece I was referencing was really more the obesity piece because of the visual uh, and a norm, normat visually normative behaviors that go on in that setting, which is one of the stresses, actually. You have to look just right. And I actually dress differently depending on the day I'm going to work and which clients I'm seeing. So you have to identify with the dress codes and, and physical behaviors and appearances in every way of the individual clients you go into, as do all the people who work in them. So, yep, loads of anorexia. Thank you. I'm glad you said that about <laughs> dress code, because I also do the same. Sometimes I change, sometimes just to annoy people, dress, <laughs> dress, 
dress differently. Um, don't wear dark grey suit or blue suit, and sometimes just to be naughty, I wear brown. Um, uh, that, yeah. that would be pretty naughty in the city. But I mean, yeah. things like if you go into Google, for example, there is a particular. I actually yeah. keep a pair of shoes in the office just in case I have to go into Google at short notice and need to look slightly eccentric. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I can see that. Over. Hello. One of the things I think is really interesting is that you all talk about the city as a kind of entity. And I, that's, that's my experience as well. I, I work with a lot of people who work in the city, high functioning. And there's a real concern for me, and it's a, it's a genuine question, because I don't think we have the answer yet about how we deal with the organisational problem. Because over the years that I've been working with addiction in, in that area, the biggest problem that I've seen is workaholism. You know, because the workaholism is completely supported, which then can sometimes be a bit of a chicken and egg. It's a bit, I hate to say it, it's a bit like the sex industry. Are people attracted to something because, or is it that they are, you know, they're using in order to manage the completely un... You know, it's impossible for somebody to work 12 hours a day and be well. It's against self-care. So, of course, you're going to use, you're going to drink, you're going to do whatever it is. And there's something for me about, how, you know, a question about how we get health and the idea that to look after people in the organisations. Because it's all very well. I, most of my clients, I end up having them work part-time if they're going back into that, that area. Because it's impossible to take care of. Do you know, do you know what I mean? It's like, well, how do no, we deal with the organisation? No, what you're saying is spot on thing? correct. I couldn't agree with you more. But uh, actually... I don't have an answer. I'm sorry to jump no. straight in, gents, but um, it's, uh, it's the world I've worked in for 27 years, and I'm going to admit I quite often work a 12-hour day, so yeah. maybe one of you could treat me. <laughs> that would be really good. Um, but the city can't challenge itself. If you think of the city, because really yeah. when we talk about the city, I say it's not geography. Yeah. It's culture. Yeah. It's a cultural system. Yes, too, yeah. And that cultural system worships that way of being. And even if that way of being isn't actually delivering what it thinks it is, which is the wealth and the productivity and all the rest of it, because it makes people overwork to the point where they become unproductive, it can't break that. So the city is almost like an addict itself. So absolutely. It itself is that thing. I've been working with um, EY. I, I will name them because they're doing something really interesting on a market-leading partner proposition. And partners work themselves, you know, Remember one of the, from another one, one of the partners saying to me, being angry is normal for a partner. If you're not normal, you're not, if you're not angry, you're not working hard enough for the role. And what I wanted them to do was give everyone a six week sabbatical compulsory every three to five years. And that is the one thing that they really, really struggle with the idea of someone disengaging for that period of time, even though you could do that perfectly safely and it would be compatible with good succession planning. They still struggle with it, even though they know people come back after breaks more productive, more inspirational, more innovative, more imaginative, more authentic, all of the things that they really need. The city, by definition, is almost an addict in its own right. Mm. So I'll no, no, no. over to you guys. And I think it's important to think about the city as not a place. I agree with you entirely. The city is a state of mind, okay, of which there are a number of different organisations. Yeah, they're the big banks and all of that lot. But there is a whole load of other organisations that operate in their own addictive ways slightly differently, like the law firms. They're not quite the same as the city. Sometimes I play a game when a patient walks in, I don't read the referral letter and try and guess which firm they've come from before they say anything. And sometimes you can get it right in, in that. And the law firms or certain groups within a firm will have their own addictive behaviours. For example, if any of you have heard of mergers and acquisitions, M&A, that is an addict's paradise. It is where you work the hardest, the longest, and if you aren't prepared to buy the articles of faith, you're out. If you don't, uh, and so this is why I talk about the rigidity of the system, that you're either there, right, so if you start questioning it, you're not going to survive emotionally or physically. Um, I have a little story. The, the city is very process driven. So, um, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, I was asked by an HR department in um, 
fairly large bank to do a presentation about codependence. And um, I said, sure, where are we going to do it? And they said, well, we're going to have a meeting um, to decide and when we'll have the meeting to put it together. So we had a meeting and then we had another meeting and then we had another meeting and then they said, can you submit your slides? So I submitted my slides and they said, can you alter them? Mm. You know, because they were terrified mm. of saying the wrong thing to the wrong people and getting the wrong idea. So it's very, very process driven. And, you know, to, to, to elicit change in that environment, it takes um, uh, someone right at the top. There was a, a, a great mental health uh, initiative by, um, I'm trying to think of the guy, John, John something, Bins. John Binns, who was a partner in a big uh, law firm. Was John he? Binns was a Deloitte partner. If you mm. Google him, you'll find him. He was really awesome. Yeah. And, and uh, he, set, he stood up and said, I have depression. <laughs> I have a, a mental health issue. And everybody was blown away. And it started an amazing process. Uh, where lots and lots of people were actually then coming forward and talking about their own stuff. So it takes pe that sort of mm -hmm. thing to actually el elicit change. I'm Mary Rose, and I've worked a lot in the third sector over the years, the voluntary sector, which more and more and more is becoming corporate, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, I've watched the people who are running these organisations mm -hmm as they acquire and merge and move into very important business looking suits. And now they're driving the people who work in these agencies in exactly the same way as it is in the city. I know a lot of people in the city and equally I know a lot of people in the third sector. Mm. And they're all working 12, 14 hour days. And the big boys, as I call them, their salaries are going up and they are driving down and they blame the government, they blame the contracting process. But actually, I've watched the people doing the jobs and I can think of three different organisations where the people coming in have come in from the business sector and they are running these um, enterprises as as corporate entities. And I think that people in the third sector are now struggling in exactly the same way. I've worked a lot in the States too. And the amount of drug addiction and alcoholism within our industry is amazing. It's intense because of the stress, because of the pressure. I don't know whether you would agree with that or whether you've seen anything similar. I would. Um, it's a really interesting question of whether, because uh, the one I'm asked quite regularly, is, is there more addiction in the workplace now than there was, the more alcoholism and drug abuse? Uh, the answer is, I suspect probably not. What it has been is very well hidden. And what's happened is now, thank goodness, some more people are putting their hands up and saying there are problems here. So what was always there is maybe coming to the surface. Now, the trouble is that many organisations will be very happy to look at their drug and alcohol issues and such, but anything else. The word sex cannot be mentioned or things like that can be really pro problematic. Uh, and so it's a large, we've got a long, long way to go before we can treat addiction. We might be able to treat drug and alcohol, but treating addiction is still a long way to go. I noticed that you, I mean, we just touched on sex just now, but sex addiction at the higher level, um, you know, they tend to be a large number of sex addicts who tend to be of a sort of alpha type of personality profile. And um, so we be interested to get your thoughts on that, but also on kind of co-occurring um, disorders that you're seeing. Is there, is there anything specific about the people that you see from the city uh, as, as against the general population in terms of the sort of mental, mental health presentations that go alongside the addiction? I've already sort of put my cards on the table because it's so long since I've worked in any other area. This is what I really know and understand. So I probably lack the normative data to say what it, how it compares with the general UK. 
population. There certainly are um, some characteristics, uh, narcissistic and anxiety characteristics of people who end up in these organisations. I've come to the conclusion that anxiety is almost a prerequisite for being successful in the city because if you're not anxious, you're not driving yourself to do that kind of work and work in the kind of way which is quite self-destructive. And actually the anxiety pe drives people to those kinds of behaviours. So what I have observed and actually have discussed with patients with anxiety is actually if you can get this under control, it's probably what's going to make you succeed in this setting. Um, and if you weren't anxious at all, you probably wouldn't succeed in this setting as a to kind of comfort people who are suffering with that. But I certainly see a lot of anxiety. And um, that coexists with then trying to calm the anxiety through be addictive behaviours to try and keep a lid on it, to keep it in equilibrium that allows you to do the thing that our society says you should want to do, which is to be able to afford to stay in hotels like this. Um, and, and we have this, this whole cultural driver for people of what we value. I don't know what your view is, Neil. Perfectionism. <laughs> Perfectionism is a good one for the city, particularly in certain parts of the city. Um, there are two good places to find a perfectionist. One is in an operating theatre, thank goodness. <laughs> and the second place you find them in big accountancy firms and some of the law firms, because it is an added bonus. But the question you're asking is, are addicts different in the city to anywhere else? No, I'm afraid an addict is an addict is an addict. Uh, what it gets them uh, is what attracts them to the environment. And a city, as I said, is this magnet where your addiction can be praised and be rewarded and be supported even until you go wrong. And then they don't want you anymore. Um, and so I don't think the addiction, besides the perfectionism and the anxiety, but we can talk about anxiety and addiction for many happy hours, um, but the, are they, is the patient any different? Uh, sex addiction is in the city, no question it's there. Sometimes it's related to drugs and alcohol, other times it's completely separate. One of the things that I think is interesting about the city is not that they're addicts, but they're really very good at code, codependency issues. And there's, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an addict I've met in the city that hasn't got a codependency trauma issue. No. It's a highly structured, organized environment, and if you've got childhood traumas and you can keep it going for a time, you're fine, but then often something small goes wrong. And one of the things I see a lot of in the city compared to my other practice, is bereavement issues. So why do I see that? People are very controlled and very organized, but then something goes wrong, an emotional hits them, boom, and the whole thing unravels. <coughs> so that's maybe one of the things I see differently. I think David's right as well, what you said earlier, when they plateau, they mm. crash. Crash, yeah. Because they're no longer getting that love, I and mean, we talk about Sex addiction is all thing about being loved for being successful and I'm, I'm great and I've got all this money and I'm really you know, powerful and all the rest of it. When they plateau, they also crash. Something else I think it's quite difficult in the city, and this is not about what sort of addicts are there, uh, but it is <coughs> difficult sometimes to get them to treatment because if you work in the city and you walk out of your job and you don't come back for five days, you know, you're half dead. You know, the, the, getting the, somebody to have a holiday is very difficult. Um, but uh, if you take somebody out of their environment for a month to go into rehab, there's almost no job left. And they know that, and it's very, very difficult to get somebody to, to a, a, you know, they'll admit they've got a problem, but to actually get them to say, yes, I'll go to a treatment centre and stay there for a month, because sometimes when they go back, it's just not the same thing ever again. I have a, I'm, I'm sort of curious about something, listening to you talking about the city. I'm English, I live in London, so I can sort of have an appreciation. I've never worked there, but I do have a respect for it. I'm curious about something. The, the, the environment is so high pressured, the peer pressure, the, the perfectionism, the desire to succeed, the greed. And yet you have on the other side of the Atlantic in particular, the likes of Brene Brown now saying that one of the best ways to succeed is to do the opposite, which is to get vulnerable, to get gooey, to get shitty, to get open, to go talk about all your problems. Do you see this as, do you see the city, the London city in particular, as being mutually exclusive? Do you see, do you see that the, the, the city could ever become this place where people are actually vulnerable, being sensitive, showing 
a slightly more feminine side, being vulnerable, or do you see it as being so high pressured, so in its own world, that the, the city and vulnerability are mutually exclusive? Can I answer that? Not whilst a great deal of the people who work in the city are ex-public school boys and girls. That's never going to happen because I don't know when it was here last, last year when Paul Sunderland did his talk on, on public schools and, and, and the result of the trauma. In that, in that meeting last year, you could hear the gasps of people. He had to stop two or three times to let people breathe because of the, of the distress it was causing. Lots and lots of people who go into the city are ex-public school boys. They get great jobs, but actually that doesn't mean that they can cope. Uh, but the, 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 the culture says, you know, you, can't, you have to behave like this, stiff upper lip, show no, 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 show no feelings. What you're describing would be fantastic, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. That's kind of sadly what I thought. I think yeah. there, is, there is shift. Yeah, I mean, so, so there's a bit, it's at the six and one and a half days. Dave is right. There is this real public school boy, stiff upper lip, trauma, ha, been there, done that, got the T-shirt twice. What do you think you're talking about? Don't be so pathetic. That, that is there. As women are coming, you talked about the feminine side as well. There are more women getting to higher positions in the city. It's still a very small number. They are not getting through to the top positions currently. So there is still a very clear glass ceiling. Now that is causing a very slow shift. And what I would say that there are some glimmers of hope I am seeing a culture in the city changing slightly where very authentic people, so that, that, that emotional authenticity is doing well. So maybe I'm being slightly, I'm going to disagree with David probably for the first and last time in my life, um, but not because he's going to do anything about it, but because he's normally right. Um, but, but I think there is a slight shift. What I would say, however, is if you look at John Binns, who you quoted, and I'll use him just as an example. John came out and said, I had anxiety, I had all these problems, I was off for six months, I came back and I'm a partner at Deloitte. Is John still a partner in Deloitte or has John become a therapist at Deloitte? John is no longer a partner. And actually at that top echelon, if you show vulnerability, however much you may make a difference, and he is one of the people I respect most in the city, he's an extraordinary man, do read his story, you don't stay as a partner. And if you ask an interesting question about the city, um, is this different in Wall Street? Is this different in Hong Kong or Singapore? The answer is, I don't think it is. No. I don't think there's any difference whatsoever. Uh, the city is not something unique. And is it different to a lot of other organizations, uh, big corporates in this country or in America? I suspect it's roughly about the same. And it is a culture, as the lady said, that's pervading a lot of sectors. I don't know the third sector, but it is, I can see it shifting. And it is a culture that is becoming a normalised working culture. But there are some flickers of hope, I think, in it. Hi, um, is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name's Deborah. I, I was one of those high functioning addicts working in the city. And um, it strikes me that the, the thing that is peculiar to the city that's been touched on is, um, is this aspect of denial um, on an individual level. It's very difficult to get uh, addicts to admit that they're addicts. Um, but also corporately was also mentioned, um, you mentioned drugs policy and actually even admitting that you had a drugs policy. It strikes me that that is in, almost intrinsic to the city because the city is very heavily regulated and if you're not being regulated, you're actually going into clients and telling them how to run their business. And that doesn't sit well if you then hold your hands up and say, well, actually, half our staff are addicts or out of control or whatever. So I, I feel this issue around the city is, is partly intrinsic because of the work that they do. It's an obvious point, but it, it relates to the jobs that they do through regulation and also through uh, reviewing clients' business. Good point. Yeah. Actually, if, you, um, uh, if you're using, you may lose your accreditation or, or your regulatory approval in a number of roles, and that's a big issue for why people don't own it. There's a lady at the back over there. Do you want to park? Oh, oh, then, then come to the desk. <coughs> hey, I have just been trying to come in for a little while. Um, I, uh, thank you for the presentations. I think they're fantastic. I've been thinking a lot about reputation and how 
um, how reputation is so important in, in financial services um, for individuals and for, for, for groups, um, and how, how much that makes denial um, so much easier and, uh, and harder to crack. And I'm wondering, we're talking a lot about individuals here, but on a corporate level, um, trying to understand the differences between um, particular organizations. Are there some that are worse than others? And if so, do they fare better or worse in terms of their, their outcomes, financially speaking, that is? Any, I mean, I know that's not your field, but any impressions that you're getting? Just trying to process what you were saying because there, there's some several very interesting questions in that. There are subcultures, and there are subcultures by business type. So there are certain types of problems that we'll see in law firms versus banking versus insurance, who still drink like fish, to be honest, um, versus other sectors in the city. And um, then there are subtle differences between the culture of those different organizations within the sector. I think you would agree with that? Yeah. So the sorts of pathologies that we're seeing in those different settings do vary. The question of whether a, 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 an organization fares economically better if it deals with it or not, I'm not aware of any work on. I do know that there's some emerging work, and the gentleman here spoke about the femininity or uh, feminine side, I love that, because that's the only woman sitting up here, but anyway. Um, the, there is evidence, for example, just um, in, in the field of medicine, that hospitals run by female chief executives do 10 to 15% better on EBITDA in the States <laughs> than hospitals run by male chief executives. Now that's just a kind of a random fact, which I quote to my male boss on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, but, but it's true, and that might suggest, that might suggest, but only suggest it's not proof, that actually if you change the culture of an organization and change some of the macho behaviors, which are not gender specific, there are lots of very male women out there, um, but uh, the, 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 if you change some of those behaviors, it might be associated with economic success. Is the city ready to embrace that at the moment? Hmm. Not really, but anyway, that's my take on it. Over I, think to you. That, I think it's very interesting. <coughs> I certainly think that some of the big corporates are now prepared to listen a lot more about <coughs> mental health yeah, than, they were do, than, than they were. Whether they've got to the next stage of wanting to listen about addiction, I think is a much more complex, much more complex question. And I, I, like you, I don't know of any literature to support. There isn't any, but the addiction goes to the heart of the culture sure. of the organisations, which is a real problem because that means they have to look at themselves. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the common factor that I, I would see would be that they're all extremely hierarchical. Very, very, very much so. So I remember when I was, when I was an, an apprentice toolmaker in Coventry a long, long time ago, um, the factory, the place next door was called GC. And if you worked at GC, uh, if you'd been there five years, you got a, a, an office. If you'd been there seven years, you got an office with a piece of carpet. If you worked there 10 years, you got an office, a piece of carpet, and a, and a telephone, and so on. And, and, I, and I think the city is very much like that. It, that. As you go through this process, you get better. But, and the people control how that works, because you don't want to feel that you've been lessened in any way, shape, or form. So they're very controlled about how they, 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 they function. It was interesting. A few years ago, I was asked to treat a very, very senior banker's sister not the banker, he very high up in one of the banks, and she was a raging alcoholic, absolutely off the Richter scale, and she came to hospital and did remarkably well, and as far as I know, still doing extremely well. And uh, I then, the, the brother came and sat with me, and I said, and he just wants to say, I just want to say thank you, how well you've done with my sister, so much better, et cetera, et cetera. I said, well, yeah, that's great, thank you very much. Um, what about your organization? Because in your organization, there are plenty of your sisters sitting around, not being treated. And you could just see the color drain from his face <laughs> as he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, you've got your sister, ill, better? Well, there are plenty of other people we could do the same to. And he said, are there? And I said, 
Yes, of course there are. And he said, oh, I've never thought of that. And this guy is setting the policies for a whole company all the way down. And his inability, even when confronted with a family member alcoholic, to see how that could translate to other people in the workplace, was I could have been talking Swahili to him. And so I think until we break that culture at the very top and let it trickle down, it's going to be an issue. There's a lady very patiently at the back. <coughs> Shall we just... Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation so far. I'm, my name is Anna and I'm from Sweden. And I can tell you that things are uh, better <laughs> where we are from my perspective because we have a legislation in place that mandates the employer to do prevention, but also pay for rehabilitation, and they get fined if they don't. And they cannot, under, under any circumstance, fire somebody with addiction problems. We have had that tried legally numerous times, and over and over again, it gets back to the, um, the uh, employer saying, no, you can't. You can't fire this person because of addiction. So, my question to you is, uh, because I believe sincerely that, that the employer can be a really, really important part of the rehabilitation process. So if you have a supporting employer and you know that your job is waiting for you, that's part of the success. So what, what are your opinions on legislation? Can we make the big employers to change by forcing, it, forcing them to do so with legislation? What an interesting idea that we could have a system in this country whereby people, uh, uh, corporates, would have to get people into treatment. I just think of that and think, God, isn't that amazing? Then I think to myself the next bit, so where are they going to be treated? In this country, the lack, and there are many good organizations, but the number of good organizations available to treat addiction, I think, is scandalous. And uh, to think that suddenly we could, it's what a wonderful idea, it'd be phenomenal. But I think the chances of us being able to legislate and be able to provide services, as I said earlier, when so little money is put into the treatment of addiction in this country, minuscule amounts, by comp and, and, and is getting less, let there be no doubt in my view, less as a percentage, when uh, it, legislation for addiction, what an interesting idea. But the bottom line is you can't sack someone for addiction yeah. anyway no. in the UK. You can if you help them and you do everything reasonable to help them and support them to come back to the workplace and they still continue with the addiction in a way that makes them incapable of doing their role, then you can dismiss for cause. But the law requires that you should in the first instance support and that is what the organisations do. As Neil rightly says, the lack of resource is a big issue. So if you're in an organisation paying for private medical insurance, which is the main source of PMI in this country now, and your insurer doesn't pay for addiction mm. services, well, there's a problem. Then there's no NHS addiction service mm. of quality available to you. And then there are the more subtle issues of this particular working environment where the job does disappear. And by default, you're not sacked but you may find you don't have a job and therefore you're redundant, so it is complex. I but I think the lack of treatment services is probably the biggest rate-limiting rate step. Mm. Just, just one point. The, the employers would also have to have a drug policy, and if they don't, they, they do get in fined. The UK. They, they are obliged now, they now to have a drug okay. and alcohol policy, and they all do. Okay, good. That, that's been a change. You know. Good morning. Um, my name is Jason. Um, I run a, a rehab facility in Jersey in the Channel Islands. Um, and we've had, I mean, it's a big finance industry in Jersey, so we, we have a huge problem with addiction in the workplace as such. Um, and it's been something that we've been working as an organization for quite a long time to, to build education with um, employers, which has actually helped in actually um, getting people into treatment or, or, or seeking seeking help, and these are uh, not just small financial institutions; these are big, big players in, in the island and in the industry. 
Um, do the panel think that education is something that we could really push more? You, going in under the health and well-being banner, because health and well-being is a big, big thing now with corporate organisations, and we talk about mental health, we talk about uh, meditation, all that type of stuff. And I've used the, the health and well-being banner to bring addiction um, and education around addiction to uh, corporates, um, and also helping them with their, their drug and alcohol policies so that we are looking after, making sure that the employee feels safe to actually come forward with regards to their addiction. Because as I've heard in this room already, um, employees in the city, for example, may be scared to come forward because of, because of what might happen. Um, well, in Jersey, we're, we're, we're actually working with the employer to educate and to safeguard the careers as well of those people. For some of those people, they might not go back into the, that particular employment, but at least they're actually getting help and treatment. I just wondered if you, if you believe that education is a, is a key way we forward. We do a huge amount of education on mental health in the workplace. I'm sorry, I'll take the question yeah, because we do have a, I have a whole health and well-being segment to my business that does health education in the workplace and mental health education. I personally do a lot of pro bono educational work around mental health and weave addiction into that. But these organisations are not very keen on saying too much about addiction because they don't want to admit they've got it. In the sense that if you talk about drug testing, which is you can't do anyway except for cause, but, but, a, but a major bank will say, well, I can't test all the trading floor because I'd have to sack 70% of them. So that just wouldn't work. I can't do that. So it's back to the denial. But yes, we do do a huge amount with education, and we do try to do education. As a business, we offer template drug and alcohol policies. We offer an advisory service pro bono to work on their drug and alcohol policies. Couldn't agree with you more. We need to help people back into the workplace. But there is that denial piece, and I yeah. think perhaps you can speak well to that. Both of you. Yeah, um, the, the, the bit that, that, that really gets to me sometimes, mm. has mm. done for years and years and years, is that um, Jill and Neil are working sometimes with their hands tied behind their backs. Because A, the corporate don't really want to talk about it, and the insurance companies feed off that and don't cover it. So you've got, for instance, Booper, who don't cover addiction, full stop. You've got another company that only uh, allow people to see a CBT therapist. You know, when you've got that performance going on, these guys here are really, really up against the wall because how can you get some? When you know somebody needs to be in a treatment centre, but you know that you can't get them into a the treatment centre because the insurance company provided by their corporate won't cover it, you know, what are you to do? It's a very, very difficult situation. And education's great, um, but, you know, I've never... I've never been able to educate an addict yet that didn't want educating. In fact, quite the opposite. Sorry, yeah. sorry, could I just... It was not about educating the addict, it's about yeah. educating yeah. the employer. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, my experience of... And we, we do a lot... Uh, Dr McLeod is an expert at educating corporates about uh, uh, mental health policies and, and drug and alcohol issues. But... Um, my experience is it depends on when the corporate wants to hear. And some will uh, embrace it and be fantastic. Uh, others won't. I had a really interesting experience the other day, a guy who treated for depression in the city, did really well on antidepressants, got back to work, doing well, and came back to see me after he's just gone rehabilitated back into workplace. He said, something really strange happened. I said, what do you mean? He said, after I got back, my boss called me into a room and sat me down. I thought, oh Lord, what's coming up here? Am I going to be thrown out? And the boss sat down, almost broken to tears, and said, you're taking the same medication as me. <laughs> and talked to him about his own depression and was so pleased that this guy had got treatment and such like. Well, I think until the boss is prepared to stand up and say, I've got an issue and I've, this is what's got me better and helped me, we're not going to get the educational change that you're going to need to change an entire corporate. So the guy whose sister I treated, until I can get him to start saying, we need to do something about this, let's have an education program, then we can start doing it. Um, we've got time for probably one more question, maybe two if we're quick. 
<laughs> over here and then... Oh. Uh, thank, you very <coughs> thank you very much. Paddy Creedon is my name. Uh, and thank you for the really excellent um, presentations. Uh, first of all, just a comment. Uh, I did some work myself in addiction in the workplace on the economic front, and it became part of a thesis back in 2002. Uh, one of the things we did find out that if you know the cost of your absenteeism mm. uh, from addictive behaviours or behavioural health, presenteeism, that's people in work with the same issues, the cost factor is three to four times that of the absenteeism rate. So people really do more harm in work than they do outside of work. Uh, but that's on the economic front. That's not my question, really. My question, we released a report recently in Ireland, um, which was new for us. It was the first, which was the hidden harm of addiction uh, in relation to families affected uh, by... Uh, and I'm in recovery myself long term, right? So when I have kids and all that kind of stuff. But I'm really interested in this. But uh, the question really is, uh, we, we came up with uh, a cost of 863 million a year. Now, relative, to all of course, in, relative to the economy, but uh, a high percentage of that was the cost to the corporate world of people who are uh, affected by others' addiction, work in the workplace. So, just want to know: Have you any comment on that? Really, or are you finding that in your practice? Absolutely, I can't agree more. I see a number of people who come to see me to talk about uh, addict members of their families and the damage and the trauma that's causing within the family uh, and how that affects them in the workplace as well. Um, yes, this is not uncommon at all. Uh, I completely agree with you. The gentleman over here. Um, I was going to raise that as well, so uh, I'll raise the other one, uh, which is, uh, you've mentioned a number of times narcissism, and we all know narcissistic personality disorder and so on is a very hard to treat, so uh, it'd be interesting to hear how you approach it. One of the things that I often get caught, well, uh, uh, Andrew's just left, well, there's a therapist in my unit, um, we often sit down the ward round and ask the question, has this person got a personality disorder? And the answer is, yes, of course they've got a personality disorder. <laughs> Tell me when they haven't. And that, to me, is missing the point. Um, I can't change people's personalities. What you can do is help them to deal with the issues that that personality arises and let them be able to deal with it. So the addictive behaviours, without doubt, their trauma and all the issues that go with that I don't see that we can actually... Okay. When the Americans get bored, forgive me if any Americans in the audience here, um, they reclassify personality disorders. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and they do it fairly regularly. So when I've just got it sorted out in my mind, it all changes. Uh, and so I think that we are very bad at diagnosing, what, uh, understanding what personality is. And therefore, to understand what the disorder of something we can't define what it is. I think that we can spend many happy hours rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and discussing personality disorders where we miss what's killing them at the moment. So I certainly think that I don't rush in the initial phases on treatment to go for personality issues. I start with the crocodile nearest the boat, which is their addiction, and then down to their cross addiction, and then down to their trauma. Yeah? And then, after that, if they wish to do some much longer term work to try and look at personality structure, that's fine. Now, call me old fashioned, and maybe that's correct, maybe I am, but it seems to me that that's a way you have to start treating all addiction. Because if you go in and start to try and change personality at the beginning, they just use more. And so you have to come at, at, at what I call, often people have heard me bore the subject, peel away the layers of the onion. The personality structure is quite often the very last thing you would go for. I, I agree with Neil completely. One of the, the, um, one of the first things I remember... Uh, when I was doing some, some, uh, some study, uh, I, somebody gave me a book by Yellum, and the first line in, in the book was, avoid diagnosis. Uh, I think it's a really good way to think about things, because 
Um, I, I agree totally with Neil that if you take away the addictive process, quite often you feel a lot of the, the, uh, the stuff starts to evaporate. Then if you deal with the, the underlying issues and especially the trauma, um, quite often some of the, the, the things that people have been diagnosed mm -hmm. with actually disappear completely. You know, one of the things I, I really hate is when I, I get a patient and they're being diagnosed with something and it all, almost disables them. You know, they are disabled by some kind person. Oh, well, you've got this. And then I, I have to spend quite a bit of time going, well, let's, let's put that to one side for a minute. Let's deal with this first and deal with this and then see what's left. And quite often it, it just gets forgotten. I, I see so many people walking through the door that have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorders. Okay, but that's because nobody's taken a proper history. And maybe if they stop the cocaine, the amphetamines and the alcohol, that maybe something could get better. And interestingly, when you treat them, or other thing is their depression, which has not been treated, you treat the depression and such like, they get better and that whole borderline personality disorder stuff goes on. I've got two big court cases going on where people are in the middle of a very uh, complex custody battles where there are children going to be taken away because someone's made a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, but actually they were profound, both of them profoundly depressed and been treated. They're a lot better and there's no reason why they can't have access to their children. But, uh, and so, but because they have that label, and we all know about labeling theory, uh, that label, it's extremely difficult to get rid of. So, um, yeah, careful. Sorry, hobby horse of mine. Um, so we've got time for one more question. One more question. Uh, who, do you want to? Well, shall we do this gentleman here? Yeah. There we go. And then that lady in the blue, and then we better stop. It's very quick, rather than a question, probably more of a comment. I'm. A therapist now, I was also a professional musician, I still am, which that journey got me into being a therapist. But the parallels that you're speaking about, power, money, sex, drugs, traveling, planes, touring, um, Absolutely. It, it was just ex exactly, and, and then the, how, how are we gonna change? You have to admit that there's a problem to make, that. it was just the, the parallels and, and the size of the problem and therefore, that whole, a whole um, cycle of repeat um, and the youth. That's the, that's if there is a difference for me in the music industry. That it's a, it's a it, it can it can actually be rewarded at a younger age, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's really troubling and um, um, disarmingly powerful. But I just I, it's just a resonation of the, of the of the of the, of the, of the pathways. I'm sure you're absolutely right, agree. Mm. The lady in the lady blue, in blue, and then we better finish or we get into trouble. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Dr. Ambicha, this is Dr. Mueller. We're both from the United States. We didn't take offense. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> she informed me the DSM-5 is a living document. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm coming from Nashville, Tennessee, which is the home base for the HCA. Yeah, okay. Um, I treat within a week about 80 opiate addicts, Gosh. okay? Wow. I'm overran, I can't take anymore. Mm. This is my mm. vacation coming to the ICAD, <laughs> <laughs> okay? The industry that I'm treating more often than not in Nashville, because it's big healthcare, I treat quite a bit of nurses, oh, yeah. mm. um, hospital residents, or residency, mm -hmm. I treat one of the top addiction, well, I'm not going to say because I want to identify, but top addiction specialist children, mm -hmm. adult children, mm -hmm. come to me. I think because who I am, be honest, the way I look, they know that their reputation is not going to be tarred because I don't run in those circles. I don't cocktail with those people. I will not talk. So that's why I get so many. Because mm -hmm. they said, go see her down this street around the corner. <laughs> Nobody will know, okay? <laughs> okay, and they trust me because they know. Excellent care. And they, yes, and, they, and I keep my mouth shut, mm. okay? But the stigma in the healthcare industry on addiction is ridiculous. Mm. Nurses come crying to me because they're afraid they're going to lose their license, okay? The children of the doctors don't want it to get out amongst their friends. 
And I was like, we are in the healthcare industry and we can't even deal with this. And to know that it can be treated, to know that it's chronic, to get away the shame. I mean, it's just incredible to me because out of the 80 I see, and I see people from welfare, homeless, all the way up, I tell anybody, it's from the pulpit to the door. It's everybody. But the main industry I have to deal with to change their perspective and to say, hey, you can go back to work, you can keep your job, is that RN, is that medical resident right out of medical school to know you still have a career. Mm-hmm. And then me fighting with the medical board of Tennessee. <laughs> you know. So you're talking about physicians and training. Oh, yeah, physicians and training. Oh, yeah, because even though the laws have changed, you're not like when I started 20 years ago, where you're up 36 hours straight. Mm-hmm. Now they're supposed to let you sleep, mm-hmm. supposedly, mm-hmm. but not really. You know? So what? they're taking amphetamines. They're taking, it's not just coffee. No, 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 no. Oh, no. I'm, yeah. I, I hope and I pray that we do not have the opiate epidemic that you have at the moment. Mm. And uh, if any of you know about the statistics coming out of the States, that what is 110 people a day are dying? Yeah. From 185. Op- 185. Yeah. It's gone up. Uh, yeah. 185 per day are dying from uh, opiate overdose. Uh, and a, a national emergency in my view. If that ever happened in this country, the, I would hope they would be rioting on the streets. Yeah. But anyway, I hope you have a good rest in this country. <laughs> <laughs> we better finish at that point. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.